began inconspicuously, as such things always do, as a small company called Soft Disk, and yet even then there were signs that various agencies of darkness had taken an interest in the place. Firstly, there was Shreveport itself. Green and piney, but infernally hot in summer, the sort of place where it seemed like bliss to stay indoors all day, programming with no thought of the outside world. Today, the riverboat gamblers have blessed the town with a renaissance of sinful wealth, but in those days after the collapse of big oil, the town had no economy to speak of. Managers at Taco Bell could live like kings, and programmers could be had for a little more than $5 an hour. To demonstrate the state of the nation's economy at the height of the Reaganomics, this high wage attracted talented programmers from all over the country. In September of 1987, with a degree in computer science, a young programmer named Tom Hall made the trek south to Shreveport. Shreveport was and always would remain synonymous with hell for Hall, who marked it thus on his maps when he later managed to escape, but the programming was good. Softdisk put him to work creating games for the Apple II. Five to ten programs on one disc, one disc slapped out each month. The computer game industry was just picking up steam, rising in the shadow of video games. System prices were coming down, demand was high. For hard-working programmers, there were literally no limits to what could be accomplished, and Hall was not alone in his ambitions. Through the devious machinations of some cosmic puppet master, Softdisk attracted an entire team of programmers and artists with a bent for graphic mayhem. In March of 1989, John Romero joined Softdisk and made Tom Hall's acquaintance. Romero had spent much of his childhood in California, attended high school in England, and then lived in Salt Lake City until he felt he'd suffered enough from the depredations of do-gooding citizens. He spent several years adapting Apple games for the Commodore and vice versa, while programming and publishing his own games on the side, and studying various volumes of necromantic lore. At Softdisk, Romero set to work programming games for the IBM PC, the Gamer's Edge project. Romero's games soon attracted the interest of a freelance programmer in Kansas City, John Carmack by name, who had been working at a pizza parlor and programming in his spare time. Carmack's programs impressed Softdisk enough that they offered him a job, so he, too, headed for Shreveport, driving down in a decaying brown MG. The two Johns joined forces, and it was not long before Tom Hall began to sneak in at night to work with them because Softdisk management would not allow them to collaborate openly. Then, the first breakthrough. John Carmack devised a smooth scrolling routine similar to what had been used for the background of Nintendo games, but never before possible on the PC. When Tom Hall saw scrolling in action, his first thought was to pull a prank on Romero. In the course of one night, Hall and Carmack reproduced the first level of Super Mario 3, pixel by pixel. Replacing Mario with a character of their own, named Dangerous Dave. They finished the work around 5am, calling it Dangerous Dave in copyright infringement. Romero arrived at soft disc, booted up the game, and did not stop to take a breath until three hours later. More than a prank, Romero saw the staggering commercial potential of Carmack's design. Did he also see the sinister forms which thronged the fetid streets of Shreveport, as if in celebration of rapidly approaching catastrophe? The archives are silent on this point, but in that moment, with dollar signs flashing in Romero's eyes, id Software was truly born. There was also, at Softdisk, a project manager named Jay Wilbur, formerly of Chile, Rhode Island, now enjoying the warmth and unhurried lifestyle of the South. Romero approached Jay with a new Super Mario demo. Allured by the same visions of limitless wealth, Jay approached Nintendo. It is rumoured that its Mario demo made its perilous way to the highest levels of Nintendo, but those records are written entirely in Japanese, which I cannot read. Shinto priests in the employ of the company must have decided that Mario wasn't PC and nixed Nintendo's entry into the PC market after consulting various oracles. In the end, the team of secret conspirators at Softdisk decided to pursue the game on their own. Meanwhile, a series of peculiar fan letters had been arriving at Softdisk, praising John Romero's games. This story has been told so many times that it hardly seems worth mentioning, yet perhaps we should view it in the more sinister light. 
at first, seeming to represent the ravings of a wide number of soft disk fans, Romero eventually determined that all the letters came from the same address in Garland, Texas. Discovering the fraud, Romero fired off a threatening letter, missing from this file but known officially as the Psycho Letter, and in this manner made contact with its first benefactor. Scott Miller, anonymous author of The Many Letters, was a founder of Apogee Software, a pioneer in the shareware approach to marketing computer games. Great Kufalu must have whispered to Miller in his dreams, urging him to seek out the boys at Softdisk. Nothing less than Eldritch madness can explain his next actions. He told Romero that he loved the Softdisk games and wanted to lure them into the shareware market. Romero sent a Miller a game called Catacombs, which whetted Miller's appetite, but once he got a glimpse of a Super Mario demo for the PC that Carmack and Romero had done, he offered to put money up to finance their first real game. Thank you for watching this first episode charting the story of id Software. Keep your eye out for future episodes. If you want to watch some previous videos, click one below. You can also subscribe, contribute towards my Patreon, or just get the hell out of here. In any case, thank you very much for watching, and good night.